just look for the blue and white box in the corner over there. And without further ado, let's get started. Family life. Good afternoon. Uh, it makes me very happy to be here with uh, Akhil Sharma today. I haven't said it enough that Family Life is my favorite book of 2014. In fact, it was right here at the Press Terrace last year. I was interviewing Jonathan Franzen, and I asked him who he thought, um, and since he's known as the great American novelist, who he thought the great Indian novelist was. And he said it was a difficult question to answer, which it is. And he said Rushdi and Jhumpa Lahiri, Vikram Seth, Rohington Mystery. And then his eyes sort of lit up and he said, Akhil Sharma, have you read him? He's a terrific writer. And uh, part of that interview is actually quoted on the cover of the Indian edition of the book. Uh, so I feel a great kinship to the book. Uh, a little more about the book. So Family Life comes uh, nearly 13 years after uh, Akhil Sharma's first book. An Obedient Father shook the literary landscape in 2000. Um, it won uh, votes of confidence from luminaries like Franzen, also Joyce Carol Oates. It won the Penn Hemingway Prize and a Whiting Award. Uh, but it had a very bleak premise. It's about uh, a single mother who is forced to go and live with the father who molested her as a child. Um, so it, it sort of was indigestible for the masses. Uh, the second book, Family Life, also has a bleak premise. Akhil specializes in those. But to add to it, it's also semi-autobiographical. It draws from Akhil's own coming-of-age story uh, as a young boy who moves from New Delhi to New York uh, with his family that comprises uh, his parents, uh, him, and an older brother, an overachieving older brother on whom the hopes of the family are pinned. Um, and it's a usual immigrant tale until um, this brother called Birju in the book suffers a freak accident um, in a swimming pool and is left uh, brain damaged and paralyzed for life. Um, so the story is told from the younger son's uh, perspective called Ajay. Um, the father resorts uh, to this whole unfortunate situation by becoming an alcoholic. The mother submits herself to a cast of outlandish miracle workers. So what we are left with is little Ajay, poor little Ajay, who has to make sense of this by himself. I mean, he, his parents are busy with their you know, own uh, difficult situations. And uh, so the, one of the beautiful things about the book is that despite this backdrop of the family tragedy, um, Akhil manages to infuse it uh, with a great deal of humor. So Ajay, for instance, believes in a god that looks like Clark Kent. Uh, he thinks that temples in New York are fake because they don't smell of rotting flowers and sweat like temples in India do. He thinks their father has been assigned to them by the government because he seems to serve no purpose. And as the book progresses, Ajay is also growing older, so the narrative voice matures um, and he has you know, more deeper psychological observations uh, towards the end of the book. But uh, it's a beautiful book by all accounts, and I urge you to you know, go buy a copy and read it after this session. Uh, please join me in welcoming Akhil here today. Akhil, so you've just arrived uh, in Jaipur late last night or this morning. You... Uh, my flight landed at 3 a.m., and then my, I learned that my morning flight had been canceled. And so I... Uh, Sometimes I get angry and I begin to enjoy being angry. And so I said, uh, I became all upset and I, did, I, got, I hired a car. And even though I was now peacefully sitting in the back of a car, riding to Jaipur, I kept looking around thinking, what can I be angry about next? Uh, so, but I got here at about 10 a.m., yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. You know, the experience of writing a book and the experience of reading a book is so strange. Uh, it's so private, so intimate, that when I see you, uh, see an audience like this, all these people who, who appear eager and excited, uh, I, I, I feel almost like I'm meeting family. Uh, so thank you for coming. I, it's, an, 
it's a privilege to get to get to talk before you. Mm -hmm. Also, Akhil, so you've been, you know, the great toast of the New York literary circuit. Even before Family Life was out, you were writing a bunch of pieces for the New Yorker. Is this the first time you're addressing a primarily, you know, an Indian audience in India? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the it's the first time I'm addressing a large audience okay. uh, mm -hmm. of Indians in right. India. I've I've read uh, and spoken before. 10 or 15 um, audiences of 10 or 15, but you know this book has given me a lot more attention, and so uh, larger audiences. Okay, so um, one of my first questions is Akhil, since uh, you know you've you've said yourself that the book is semi-autobiographical, it draws a lot from your own life. Did you consider writing it as a memoir, and what made you go down the fiction route? Um. I, I did ch uh, think about writing it as a memoir. I felt that I wouldn't be able to do it justice. The emotions that that are um, that occurred. So, for example, in um, in my own life after my brother's accident, I wouldn't tell people in school about my brother uh, because I felt somehow that they wouldn't understand it. Right, and so they wouldn't. Uh, I felt that if if they didn't understand it, I would almost be harming my brother in some way. And the the problem is that that is not dramatic. You know, all of the action is occurring inside the character's head. So in this book, so for me, as a real, in my own life, my brother was a secret. Uh, in the book. Ajay go, begins going around, he feels the same pressure that people won't understand, that his friends won't understand. So he begins going around telling lies about how wonderful his brother was. And because he's telling lies, he is also creating a secret. So it's the same thing. I had a secret and Ajay, the character, has a secret. But his secret is dramatized and is larger. Uh, so it's d distinctions like that, trying to figure out a way to convert what is, what is not uh, compelling to an audience and what is very interior and turning it into something that will be of interest to an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so Akhil, you have written about your brother's accident and what your family went through in, in various essays that you've done in the past. Um, was, it, was it very tough revisiting it for a full length book or do you think having written those pieces you had sort of expressed or got that out of your system in a way and was that easier to deal with this? You know, essays tend to be 800 words or 1,000 words or 1,500 at the most. And so to a large extent, it's hard to actually say much. Like what usually happens is um, by the time you've established something, you've already used 600 words. Right. And so it's hard to actually begin to say anything so complicated. So just the rough details of what really exactly, happened. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, in, an, in a New Yorker piece that you wrote just before the book was out, you spoke about the three technical challenges that you encountered while writing the book, you know, the emotional challenges aside. You spoke about um, having no plot and writing from the perspective of a child, because when the book starts, Ajay is mm -hmm. eight or ten and um, you know about detailing the physical horrors of the accident because mm -hmm. people aren't it's difficult for you know readers to digest that can you tell us a little more about these the technical challenges sure so you know i uh, one of the unfortunate things about life in general is that you know all of us are going to have to deal with people we love getting sick you know, it's already, either we've already dealt with it or we will deal with it in, at some point. And, you know, physical illness is a horror, is a horror. Uh, and the problem is that in fiction, when we're reading it, we, quick, we quickly become overwhelmed by pain. And so we turn away, we put the book down. And so you have to figure out how much pain can you reveal to the reader uh, before the reader is going to put the book down, but that's you know that's some that's just a mi that's a minor challenge, right? Because you've I've seen it done before. Another sort of challenge is writing from the point of view of a child, because children can't process things. You know they can't really understand things, um, and so they're 
understanding of the world is simple, which means that oftentimes if their understanding of the world is simple, to some extent the world becomes simple, the world becomes flat uh, when you're writing from their point of view. And that too, so that also there are ways to get around it. Uh, for me, what was the big challenge was figuring out how to write a book where there isn't much plot. So in, when by plot I mean that something occurs and that thing then causes another thing to occur and then causes a third thing to occur and sort of like dominoes. Whereas in my book, A occurs which causes B, which causes C and then G occurs and then L occurs and N occurs because in fact that's really what life is, that so many things are random uh, and it's hard to write that without, cr without the book becoming shapeless. And so there were certain technical solutions that I developed over, uh, I wrote about 7,000 pages and it's a short book, it's only 200 some pages uh, and there were certain technical solutions that I came with came up with such as uh, figuring out how to write a book which has, um, which only uses certain elements of the senses as a way to have the reader read it very quickly. Uh, so things like that. So, but that was the, that third challenge was the hardest of the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also said that your parents don't read your work. Uh, do they not read anything you've written or, or are they, you know, purposely keeping away from this portrait of your family? Uh, my, my father doesn't read at all, okay. uh, period. Uh, not only does he not read, he doesn't believe that other people read either. He thinks that when they claim to have read a book, they're just being pretentious. Uh, my mother reads occasionally, but mostly things like Sarita or other women's magazines. Um, she, she did read this book and she, she asked me why some of the things were true and some of the things were not true. Uh, but I don't think they have... Uh, my parents get... I'm, I'm not totally sure why they don't read my work. Uh, I think they're just not that interested in it because they just assume it's not true, so why pay attention to something that's not true? Um, the book sort of mentions, and I believe it's true to life, that when you all moved to the U.S., your father took you and your brother to the library and offered to pay 50 cents per book you read. So they did believe in the importance of reading and encouraged you and your brother to read. And you wanted to check out comic books, and he said, I'm not paying you 50 cents for these books. So uh, that, that was actually an uncle of mine who did it. So he's uh, become a father in the... He, in that the little element I took from him and attributed it to my father. Right. But my family does value education. Mm -hmm. My mother really values education. Mm -hmm. uh, my father not as much. Okay. Uh, so the book opens with, uh, you know, the family moving, uh, uh, the tickets for New York arriving for your mother, uh, you and your brother. And you know, the father in the book is already in the States then and um, sort of you describe the middle class Delhi neighborhood and how excited but jealous the neighbors are and you write that some families actually hired uh, wedding bands to play outside their house when they left for yeah. a foreign country. So tell us a little about your, you know, this childhood in Delhi and, and how true this was, how close it is to the book. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you guys remember what it was like to go abroad in the 70s uh, but it was a really big deal, like people would hire bands to perform outside the house the night that you would, uh, that you would go to the airport. Uh, everybody would squabble as to who got to, when somebody was coming from abroad, everybody would fight about who, who would get to go and pick up the person. Uh, the, all the, you know, when we went, uh, when we went to America, Basically, whatever was not nailed down on the airplane, we took with us off the airplane. So little, um, those little pillowcases, the uh, salt and pepper packets, all these things. And people would bring them when they came into the country as well. All this weird chewing gum, all this strange stuff. Um, so this is very accurate, th those details. And how people used to feel envious about the fact that somebody was going to get to go to America. It was enormously glamorous. Uh, 
I know that I felt very privileged that we were going to get to go to America. Okay. So, um, so you know, you spoke a bit about writing from the perspective of a child. I, I feel like some of the things Ajay says in the books are so funny. There's this one part he says, I decided that when I was married, I would be very serious and my silences would lead to misunderstandings between me and my wife. We would have a fight and later make up and kiss. She would be wearing a white swimsuit as we kissed. So what was it like, you know, um, trying to figure out this voice of an eight-year-old na narrator? Did you have nephews or that you were talking to? Were you hanging out with children? Were you reading children's books, watching children's television? One doesn't quite imagine you. You're quite serious as somebody who sort of recollects all of this from their childhood. Oh, you know, like when, when I was a child, um, I kept wondering, when I was a little kid, I kept wondering, when am I going to get to kiss a girl? When will this happen for me? Uh, and I remember thinking, you know, I had no idea how relationships were formed. I had no idea what a marriage is. So I based all of my, my sense of what relationships were based on weird Amitabh Bachchan movies and uh, Love Boat. So it was that strange combination that, uh, that I remembered. I remembered how, I, th I think also for men, it takes a little while before you realize, you know, I'm sure there are grown men who still think in childish ways about women. Mm -hmm. So it, it, w it wasn't that far off from my own imagination. Well, um, I hope you've had your white swimsuit moment, yeah. though, Akhil. Okay, so the book also chronicles the birth of a writer. Ajay is um, um, very, I think it's a very honest admission, but Ajay is reading Hemingway biographies so that he can pretend to have read all of Hemingway and talk to people about how much he's read. He's not actually reading the Hemingway books initially. Um, so, did Hemingway play an important role in shaping your writing, or was that something you borrowed from another character as well? Uh, I, my, um, you know, when I was a kid, I would, I wanted attention, right? And the, the, one of the few ways that I could get attention was by appearing smart. And so oftentimes I would, uh, I would lie and claim to have read books that I had not. And at some point I decided to read this, read biographies of writers, uh, because then I could pretend that I had read these writers. So I got this biography of Hemingway and I still remember where I was sitting when I began reading it. Like I was sitting at my kitchen table, it was early in the morning and I began to feel, uh, I was just so, so amazed that this man had gotten to travel around Europe, that he managed to have such a good life. Uh, whereas I expected my own life to lead to me, involve me becoming an engineer or a doctor. So I began reading about Hemingway, so I read, I, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 books about Hemingway before I ever read anything by Hemingway. And my goal when I read these books about Hemingway was simply, how do I learn to write so I can get a good lifestyle? So that's exactly what I did. Okay. Um, so Akhil, before we go ahead, I think it'll be nice to give the audience a, a little taste of the prose. Uh, so we we picked that part where you start with uh, your father being assigned to you by the government. Mm. So we'll do a short reading. So, so this is, um, uh, you know, Ajay is eight years old. Uh, and I, here, here we go. I used to think that my father had been assigned to us by the government. This was because he appeared to serve no purpose. When he got home in the evening, all he did was sit in his chair in the living room, drink tea and read the paper. Often he looked angry. By the time we left for America, I knew that the government had not sent him to live with us. Still, I continued to think that he served no purpose. Also, I found him frightening. My father was waiting for us in the arrivals hall at the airport. He was leaning against a metal railing and he appeared angry. I saw him and got anxious. The apartment my father had rented had one bedroom. It was in a tall brown brick building in Queens. The apartment's gray metal front door swung open into a foyer with a wooden floor. Beyond this was a living room with a red, reddish brown carpet that went from wall to wall. Other than in the movies, I had never seen a carpet. 
Biju and my parents walked across the foyer and into the living room. I went, to, I went to the carpet's edge and stopped. A brass metal strip held it to the floor. I took a step forward. I felt as if I were stepping onto a painting. I tried not to bring my weight down. I remember feeling that way about stepping onto a carpet. I had never stepped on one before I got to America. My father took us to the bathroom to show us toilet paper and hot water. Again, this is something that my father did. While my mother was interested in status, being better educated than others or being considered more proper, my father was just interested in being rich. I think this was because although both of my parents had grown up poor, my father's childhood had been much more desperate. At some point, my grandfather, my father's father, had begun to believe that thorns were growing out of his palms. He had taken a razor and picked at them till they were shaggy with scraps of skin. Because of my grandfather's problems, my father had grown up feeling that no matter what he did, people would look down on him. As a result, he cared less about convincing people of his merits and more about just owning things. The bathroom was narrow. It had a tub, sink, and toilet in a row along one wall. My father reached between Biju and me to turn on the tap. Hot water came shaking and steaming from the faucet. He stepped back and looked at us to gauge our reaction. I had never seen hot water coming from a tap before. In India, during winter, my mother used to get up early to heat pots of water on the stove so we could bathe. Watching the hot water spill as if water being hot meant nothing, as if there were an endless supply, I had the sense of being in a fairy tale, one of those stories with a jug that is always full of milk or a bag that never empties of food. During the coming days, the wealth of America kept astonishing me. The television had programming from morning till night. I had never been in an elevator before, and when I pressed a button in the elevator and the elevator started moving, I felt powerful that it had, that it had to obey me. In our shiny brown mailbox in the lobby, we received ads on colored paper. In India, colored paper could be sold to the recycler for more money than newsprint. The sliding glass doors of our apartment building would open when we approached. Each time this happened, I felt that we had been mistaken for somebody important. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, so Akhil, coming back from the book to your own life, I feel the lines are very thin, so it's difficult to make that shift. Of course, yeah. But uh, you studied public policy at Princeton, and then uh, you attended a very prestigious writing program at Stanford, and then you tried your hand at screenwriting for a while. I couldn't find much information about that screenwriting gig, except that you had a bad experience with it. Could you tell us? And so that made you go back to Harvard Law School. So you sort of went to writing, went back to law school, then quit your job, and then got to writing again. So tell me about that screenwriting gig. What happened there? So um, I graduated from college. Uh, I went to Stanford for a, with a creative writing fellowship. And while I was there, I was thinking, you know, I would really like to make a lot of money. Like in my heart of hearts, I would like to make a, a ton of money. And so I thought, well, what's an easy way to make money without doing much work? And I thought, let me write screenplays. Uh, so I looked around, I thought about what kind of rubbish would people like to watch? So I concocted, uh, a screenplay which was truly rubbish. It was based on Beowulf. And, uh, based on what? Beowulf. Okay. Because I thought, you know, here's a big brand name that nobody has exploited. And I sent it in to Universal Studios. And I was right. They loved it. Uh, so I got invited to come down to Hollywood and write for the movies. And so I did that for about a year and, and more. And it's funny, you can have a career writing things and make an okay living and not have anything that's actually produced and not make a ton of money, just sort of an okay living. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be, it just seemed so miserable, that life. So I decided it wasn't for me. Um, and then I went to law school and then I became an investment banker. And then you quit investment and then banking I quit investment when you banking. were 30. So what was that? You know, that damn wall, like what made you quit at 30? Uh, I just had had enough. You know, it was, um, you, I, I was working 
such enormous hours uh, and I was traveling constantly. I mean, I was, I would be, like I, I got married, uh, I returned to uh, America on a Sunday morning, I walked off the plane and I got paged, uh, I got home, changed, went to the office, worked all day. Uh, Monday morning I went to Chicago, was in Chicago two days, came back to the office Wednesday. Thursday I went to San Francisco, came back Friday, worked all night Friday night. Saturday morning I went to San Francisco again. And it was just, it was, uh, I was traveling so much that one time I went to a, a, a movie theater, I sat down and I reached for the seat belt, like I was about to sit down on an airplane. Um, so it just, uh, it just was not pleasurable. It was actually actively bad. Um, so that's why I quit. Okay. So, so you worked on Obedient Father and then there was a 12-year gap for family life. Now, I don't think novelists are accountable for their time, like why did you take 12 years? But I was wondering, did you actually write this book over 12 years, did you take a break? Because An Obedient Father also was quite a bleak book, you know, did you sort of want to step back from it a while and try other forms of writing? You wrote a lot of essays and short stories in between. Uh, yeah, no, I worked on this thing pretty much every day. Uh, I worked using a, a stopwatch. So I would have this stopwatch on next to my keyboard, my computer keyboard, and uh, if a phone call, my goal was to work for five hours every day to sit there for five hours every day. I was not responsible for producing anything. I was not responsible for it being good. I was responsible for sitting there. Could you surf the internet while you were no, sitting there? No, I couldn't, there? I couldn't surf the, so if a phone call came, I would stop the stopwatch. If, um, if I checked my email, I would stop the stopwatch. So I could do nothing, but I couldn't do anything other than nothing. That's and so I sat there every day and I wrote and I produced 7,000 pages, which is the equivalent of 36 novels. Uh, and I decided that, um, I mean, I, the, the reason I didn't do much else was because I, it was such a horrible experience writing this book that I felt that if I stopped, I would just stop. I would n never go back to it. Uh, it was like chewing stones, you know, it really was. I feel like I, sh I was, I had just turned 30 when I started the book and I'm, uh, I turned 42 or so when I finished it. And I really feel like I sort of shattered my youth against this book. Okay. So your, your desk in your Manhattan apartment is wedged inside a closet now. Was it wedged inside a closet for all those 12 years? You like writing in those confines, you feel secure uh, in a closet. It, I mean, you make it sound bleaker than it actually is. <laughs> it sounds very uh, exciting, actually, like uh, step into a closet and write. But uh, I'm just it's, worried about ventilation. It's, it's and a like little cubby. It's okay. a little cubby, but there's a window. Uh, and I like the idea of being sort of compressed. Like there's nothing other than me and the computer. Nothing to distract you also. Nothing to distract me. And just the, I sort of feel like when, you, when I'm working on a sentence, I'm sort of disassembling a bomb, you know, and uh, I want that concentration and the, the physical pressure, the physical intensity comforts me. Mm -hmm. I, finding, I find it soothing to be held swaddled in space, you mm -hmm. know, like uh, how little kids, infants begin crying unless they're sort of held tightly. That's mm -hmm. sort of what it's like for me. Mm -hmm. um, also, Akhil, I find that a lot of first books tend to be autobiographical. In your case, it was, uh, in, you know, your second book. Is there, I mean, was this too difficult a subject matter to, to sort of cover for your first book? Can you explain that? Uh, I mean, I think to some extent, all books are autobiography, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the first book is, is uh, sort of the autobiography of my guilt. You know, the first book is about a child molester. And I felt such shame for being okay. Uh, and I wanted to, f and I knew of course that there was no reason to feel shame. And, and so I was looking for some justification, some explanation for my shame, some, some way to, I had this feeling, let me create a narration, a narrative where that 
Sheen would be justified. So I came up with this person. Uh, whereas this, this thing, this second book is, a, is the autobiography of sort of my love of my family. Mm -hmm. uh, the, somebody said to me that the, that the mother comes across as, a, as very tough. Uh, whereas I think of that toughness as sort of my description of her almost as a love letter. You know, like I admire my mother and I admire my father tremendously. Mm -hmm. And so their difficulties, the, you know, to, to some extent, it present, when I think of what it means to love somebody or to be loved, to me it's almost the same thing as being known. Like if you were, if you were to say to me, uh, you're wonderful, right? If you were to say that to me, I would say, but you don't know me. Uh, but if you were to say to me, oh, I know all these different things about you and I, and I accept you, you know, that's okay, this is what it means to be a human being, then that love would have meaning. And so I present these characters who are very difficult and complicated and troubled, uh, but I think that they're also very devoted and very brave and very faithful. Uh, and so for me, these people, to me, the book feels like much more of a love letter to my family. Mm -hmm. um, Akhil, one of your most shared and I think most uh, popular pieces is a very, uh, very biting confessional essay that you wrote for an American magazine about, uh, you know, your adolescence and you were sleeping with older women and how you got over that. Um, so that's, that's a part of your life that, that's not in the book. So I feel in the book we sort of skip from this childhood and then we zoom to you know him as an investment banker and we're not really covering those late teen years um, since that's such a big story in itself you know you've, you've explored that in that essay um, was that a conscious decision to leave that out so you you know you didn't want to draw attention away from the tragedy and the accident would it have become like too you, complicated you know the in the reality is that you know we're there's so many things in our life that are very complicated uh, that are so bizarre and you know I had my own you know I had the problem of my family and then I had other weird issues going on that I was dealing with and it seemed that if I dealt I couldn't have both of those in the same book without diffusing the intensity of the book right um, so towards the end of the book uh, Ajay is finally experiencing some happiness and it ends on this very ambiguous note where he says the happiness felt heavy and that's when I knew I had a problem. Um, is that something, is that psychological aspect something you plan to explore for future short stories or future essays? Because I'm very curious about what happens to Ajay after this. I mean, you feel so close to the character because you've, you've seen him grow from this eight-year-old boy in New Delhi to, you know, his whole adolescence, early adolescence in New York and then we sort of it ends and you're like, what happens to Ajay? Does the white swimsuit happen? What happens? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the book has, a, has an ending. Um, my editor and I spent three months sort of going over the last couple of pages over and over. Um, in some ways, you can end the, the book uh, at the end of the chapter where the, the chapter before, you know, where, there, where you have the mother going with the uh, with her son to the to the dinner, and where she gets very angry, and they walk home, and they right. have the flashlight, mm -hmm. and that would be a fine place to end it. The problem is that you know if you grow up with difficulties in your family, you never really get over this stuff. You know they continue, the repercussions go on and on and on, uh, and so for me, I felt that. Uh, what happens at the end is Ajay is going is um, with this very pretty woman. They're at this pool. Um, she gets out. She is drunk, and he helps her. And he finds holding her drunken body against him very soothing. And it makes him feel like he's home because it reminds him of what his father was like being drunk. And that's when he realizes that you know that to be taking care of a drunk person makes him feel at home. And that's when he realizes that he has a problem. You know, there are many of us who, you know, we all to some extent want to reconstruct home. 
you know, we, we want to reconstruct what our childhood. And oftentimes our childhood was not ideal. Mm -hmm. So I, it'd be nice if you could just read out that part that you just mentioned with Birju holding the flashlight. I think it's, it's such an important part of the book because it sort of signifies why Birju's accident was so much more pronounced for the family because he was, like the family had sort of placed all their hopes on him to alleviate their circumstances. It's just like a little bit walking to the next page. Mm -hmm. So the, at this point, uh, Ajay, the, the protagonist, has gotten into Princeton. He's going to be fine. He knows he's going to be fine. But he's going to be fine and he also knows that he's going to be leaving his parents. And you know, if, I know that for me what happened when my, after I got into Princeton and I knew I was going to be fine was, I didn't want to be fine. I didn't want to be okay because I knew that my parents were not going to be okay. You know, I... I didn't, want, I didn't want to leave my parents, you know. It didn't matter to me that, that my life was good because why should my life be good when their life was not? Um, and so he's, so he's gotten into Princeton, he's invited to a dinner party where his mother behaves, gets very angry and behaves quite oddly uh, and they leave the, the dinner in a hurry and she's, so they're walking home uh, it was dark outside. Well, without finishing dinner, we left the house. It was dark outside. A half moon that was a scrubbed white hung low over the rooftops. We stood for a minute in Mrs. Sethi's driveway. We had walked to the Sethi's. My mother opened her purse and took out a slender flashlight. She gave it to me. We started home. As we went down the sidewalk, my mother talked excitedly, angrily. Even a cow has horns, she said. Walking, I remembered that when we lived in India, the electricity would frequently go out at night, and my mother and I and Birju would be going someplace or coming back from someplace. My mother would then take, out, take a flashlight out of her purse and give it to Birju. Birju would walk ahead of us. He would guide us. He would wave the flashlight's beam over the ground. Follow me, he would say. I think it's a beautiful, I mean, it's a co really a possible ending. Um, so. Akhil, you teach creative writing at uh, Rutgers now and uh, you studied uh, creative writing as well. Um, how, I mean, there are so many MFA courses now floating around. How important is it for novelists and writers to study writing formally and what do you teach in your classes? Um, you know, you, to become a writer, you need to study writing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and to some extent you can study writing to the, normally the way one studies writing is by reading and reading very closely. And then the other way is by writing and writing over and over and over. The problem is that you can get bogged down in, in, in stupid stuff, right? You can make a mistake and, and not realize that you're, that you're banging your head against a wall. And a, a teacher can say, look, there's a very easy solution to this issue. Here's something that you can do. You know, if you, if you have a problem where you become very trapped in terms of characterizing, in terms of characterization, you become too trapped in interiority, uh, consider having the character's thoughts inside dialogue uh, marks, inside quotations, and that'll make the character feel a little bit more artificial and it'll give you a sense of liberty as you're generating sort of action within the narrative. And so there are all these different ways that um, a teacher can speed up a writer's development. Mm -hmm. So tell us what you're working on now, now that you know the whole crazy brouhaha with family life is finally kind of dwindling down. Uh, I'm working on a collection of short stories and essays. Uh, okay. I hope to be done with that this year. Okay. Thank you, Akil. Should we open it up for questions? Uh, hi, Akhil. The passage that you read, uh, the description of family life, that was read first in the New Yorker magazine. And then the book came and the reading completely changed for me. We were no more reading Ajay, but it was more Akhil because of the background that was into our minds. It was more like reading Kafka. We were always into the mind of Kafka, uh, not really into the character. So 
and that is such a strong uh, uh, influence over the reader. So do you think it's fair to control the reader's imagination in like the both ways, not just being the writer, but also kind of an extension of the character actually? Uh, you know, to some extent, I mean, in theory, of course, uh, the writer is always trying to control the imagination of the reader, right? That's the nature of what writing is. The, there's sort of this second issue of what do you do when a book tracks um, autobiographical elements, right? Because then it's hard for the reader to read without that overlay, without that knowledge, right? Uh, to some extent, you know, most readers just read a book. They don't Google search an author. They don't do any of these things. They pick up, they read a review, they, and they decide to buy a book or somebody recommends it. And so for most people, that overlay does not exist. It exists for sophisticated readers, you know. Uh, and so th that's, I think that's a very valid sort of thing. Like, what do you do in that situation? I don't really know, you know, it's not... Look, I wrote a book based on my life. I can't, you know, people know it's my life. Uh, I just, I don't really know if there's any way to get around it. We'll take a question from the back. Anybody in the back? Hi, uh, just wanted to ask, do you think having a troubled family life helps you become a better author or is it a criteria to help becoming an author? always wonder. Uh, you know, there are many people who have troubled lives, troubled family lives, and merely become troubled by it, right? And so they, it diffi becomes difficult for them to be effective. Mostly, most healthy human beings benefit from being loved and taken care of and nurtured and encouraged. Uh, and so in my personal opinion that, that you know, coming from having a, a, a very healthy and loving family is a, is a more likely uh, indicator of success than having a troubled family life. Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, uh, I would like to you that uh, when you write a story and uh, something is going not good when you are writing a story, then how do you motivate yourself that uh, you going and going and finish your work? Yeah, my, you know, so I spent 12 and a half years writing this horrible thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like knowing everything I know now, I would not have, I would not write this book, right? The question is, what do you do when you're involved in some miserable thing and you can't get out of it, right? So for me, the problem was, you know, after a year, two years, you begin thinking, this, this nightmare will have to end at some point soon. You know, it's like when you're waiting for a bus, you keep thinking, oh, the bus is gonna come, the bus is gonna come. And then you feel bad because you've already spent all that time waiting for it. Mm -hmm. And so by year six, I began thinking, you know, if I stop now, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. And so the, what do you do when you don't want to work? You work, you know, it's still, uh, most people don't want to go to their job. Most people's jobs are horrible, but that doesn't mean you don't go to your job. So that's, you know, that's just, uh, that's just what it is. You know, work, work is not always fun. Part of uh, being, an adult is doing difficult things. Difficult things are difficult, you know. Two, uh, two rather unfair questions. One, did you make that money that you wanted to make? And two, are you happy? It's very deep. Uh, yes, I made that money. Uh, and am I happy? I don't know if... Uh, that's the, the proper question, right? Like I think as one gets older, really the proper question becomes how meaningfully engaged are you in your relationships, in your work, in your life? Because happiness, you know, I could spend all day watching TV and feel happy doing that. So happiness that involves yourself 
become sort of this, this smaller and smaller circle. And so I have a very large life uh, with many friends and many relationships. And oftentimes this very large life is difficult and demanding. And uh, it's not necessarily happy because it's demanding. Um, but it's the, I think it's the right decision to lead a satisfying life. Hi, Akhil. Uh, you just said that, you know, somewhere down the line, all of us want to reconstruct our idea of home, uh, the ideal childhood and all those things. Uh, and largely the character of Ajay is, you know, autobiographical. So somewhere has Ajay throughout the story helped you reconstruct yourself as an individual? Has it, you know, given you a sense of uh, correcting yourself for where you were wrong throughout your life? And is that really helped you? Uh, I mean, if you, you can't spend 12 years thinking about something without learning about it. Uh, so spending 12 and a half years writing this book, I learned, you know, like there would be days and I, I would remember something and I would think, God, that was horrible. Uh, some days I would look back upon it and I would feel uh, unhappy for my parents. Some days I would look back and I would think, why did my parents do that? That was just so stupid. Uh, some days I would look back and I would just laugh because it was so strange. And revisiting these things, eventually you begin to think, you know, it happened, you know, things happen. Uh, what do you do today to be happy? Like, how do you, you know, you, that revisiting things helps, uh, trying to understand things helps. Uh, but I think really what helps is saying, okay, how can I be of service to others? You know, I have, you know, lots and lots of people have difficulties. They have their, they might not have the same difficulties that I had, but they have their own difficulties. Um, the feelings, the emotions are the same. You know, the emotions of, um, of a wife taking care of a sick husband are, are in some ways, the situation is very different from, uh, uh, a mother taking care of a sick son, but they're very similar in terms of fear, uh, in terms of love, in terms of, um, you know, anxieties about money, uh, in, you know, in terms of bitterness as to why do I have bad luck and other people don't have this luck. Uh, so I think the real productivity comes, real improvement comes from beginning to try to use your, th your, your experience for something benign. There's one more right in the front. Uh, first of all, good evening, sir. Uh, I just uh, want to ask that uh, the concept of family time is uh, now getting fainted nowadays because uh, nowadays people are uh, like more into profession and they don't get a uh, very much time to talk to their family but like in western country uh, like in us we have a thanksgiving where people unite at least for one day and discuss their matter so how to overcome this type of trauma how do you keep in touch with your family with uh, i i don't i don't know i mean i i I find that our families are too much with us. <laughs> you know, that's, that's more my issue. Any questions uh, from the back? Okay, there's one uh, here. Someone could bring a mic. I want to. Okay. Could you stand up so they can just see you, please? I want to ask a question. We are very often told writing is a craft. So do you make a first drop and then rewrite and rewrite and edit? Or your first draft become the final draft? Uh, well, I wrote 7,000 pages. The book is not 7,000 pages. Uh, the lady in the fourth row. Yeah. 
Hello. I was wondering what had been your process with memories and memory searching. Uh, was that a solitary process? Was that something you were doing during your five hours a day? Was that something you shared with families like that uncle you mentioned about the library anecdote? And what, was it always there? Did you have a good memory to start with or were these things you rediscovered? Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really talk about what I was remembering to most people because most people wouldn't have the background to understand. You know, uh, most people also wouldn't care. You know, other people's little stories are not really that interesting. Uh, the, I, I, the, the way the memory sort of got generated was based on sort of the, the narrative is largely chronological. And so as I would be writing about my family arriving in this house that we had bought, the memories of that period would come back. Uh, so that's sort of how it worked through chronology. Okay, uh, so Akhil will be available for book signings uh, at the signing area. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give a warm round of applause to Akhil Sharma and Anindita Ghosh. So you have probably realized by now that the book signing works like this. You go to the bookshop first and then to the book signing area. The book signing area here at the Rajnikanda front lawns is over there in the blue and white box. That's the book signing area, so you can make your way over there uh, after purchasing a, book, a copy of the book at the book tent.